Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to this live webinar, which is titled Reflections of 40 Years of Investing in Japan. This is a 50-minute program brought to you by CityWire and the team behind the Bailey Gifford Japan Trust. My name is Amy Maxwell. I'm from CityWire and I'll be presenting today's broadcast. Today we'll be joined by our guest, Matthew Brett, from the Bailey Gifford Japan Trust. He'll be addressing many of the misconceptions around Japanese equities, some of the big changes around corporate governance that have taken place, which may have flown under many investors' radars. And on top of this, we'll also be sharing some of the exciting growth opportunities he sees within the Japanese economy. As the Trust celebrates its 40th year, I'm really looking forward to hearing how the market has changed over those four decades and what's in store for the next. Now, a little bit about how we're going to run today's session. Firstly, I'm going to interview Matthew and then we'll be putting your questions to him in the Q&A session at the end. If you have a question for Matthew about the Trust or investing in Japan, you can submit it at any point via the Q&A box in Zoom. Okay, that's it. Now I'm I'm going to welcome Matthew. Hi, thanks for joining us. Hi, Amy. Thank you. Now, from small origins in 1981, the the Bailey Gifford Japan Trust has grown to more than a billion pounds today. And over those 40 years, the trust has put in a return of 10% per annum, over double the 4% of the topics total return index. Now, given such a stellar track record. It might be tempting to wonder, are the best years perhaps behind us? Where is growth, do you think, going to come from in the next decade? Yeah, well, I think a great deal has really changed in the, the Japanese stock market over, over those decades. You know, if we go back to, for example, the early 1990s, the Japanese index was dominated by these big banks and basically was a very, very expensive way to, to buy some big banks, which turned out to be very poor investments into the future. Then when I started investing in Japan back in 2005, you still had a, a, a good amount of those big banks, a lot of the car companies dominating the index. And to be honest, as a growth investor, there weren't so many exciting ideas at that time. And actually what's so exciting for us is that when we look at, at the Japanese index now, you know, the top uh, positions in the index are much more technology focused, basically much more interesting companies. So actually, uh, if anything, I think looking forward the next 10 years is probably more exciting for a growth investing point of view than looking past, looking back over the past 20 years or so. Well, that's a, that's a great point about Japan's growth potential. But there are still lots of misconceptions around Japanese equity investing. I mean, we often hear about the triple, triple whammy, the three Ds, uh, debt, demographics and deflation being, being a barrier to returns. So how have these dynamics impacted your approach to investing in Japanese equities? Yeah, I mean, we've always been very, very much about investing in the individual companies, uh, you know, rather than getting drawn into these these macro type of, of situations. And yes, it's true, Japan's demographics aren't as exciting as some emerging markets, but equally, they're not so different to many parts of Western Europe. And in terms of the, the debt, yes, Japan, the government has a lot of debt, but in terms of the individual companies, actually they tend to have a lot of cash um, and more than half of listed Japanese companies uh, have a net cash position, which I think is, is quite an exciting uh, situation. Um, and in terms of the deflation, that's really not been a problem in Japan uh, for the past five years plus. It's really something that, that's gone away. And as we look at the world today where people seem to be more worried about inflation uh, than, than deflation, actually Japan's in a reasonable uh, place. So, you know, that's how we've delivered those those long term returns over the time is by focusing on the individual companies. But obviously, you know, it's important to acknowledge uh, to the, the audience today that although those 40 year returns you spoke about at the start have been very good, uh, there have been occasions in the past when there's been big setbacks in the share price. We looked back over the 40 years and there's actually been at least six occasions where the share price has declined by more than 30%. So, you know, really what we have to encourage people to do is to, to take this long view and understand that there can be big setbacks along the way. 
So it won't often, it won't always be a smooth ride, but but if you're in it for the long term, there is there are substantial rewards here. But how, I suppose, for, for our, our viewers, how can they be convinced that um, your positions really are committed for, for the long term? What, what evidence should, can you provide them with? Well, I think one of the, the main bits of evidence that, that investors can look at is the turnover uh, of a fund or a trust, which is basically the amount of the, the fund or trust that changes uh, compared with the previous year. And for the past 10 years, the Japan Trust's turnover has actually been fractionally under 10% per year. In other words, very roughly 90% uh, of the portfolio is the same as the previous year. So we say we're taking a long view uh, and we're investing in individual companies for the long term. And I think that very low turnover number really backs up that idea that what we're trying to do is find the good companies, put the money into those good companies and then not fiddle uh, with those positions and let those companies get on and deliver the, the growth over time. So I think you mentioned that the turnover after the, over the last decade has averaged of 9%. In your, in your view, it, is that unique among the marketplace? Yeah, we certainly think that it's, it's without parallel in the Japan investment trust space. Uh, perhaps the only one that would be similar would be Shin Nippon, uh, which is also managed by Bailey Gifford, so a similar very long-term uh, time horizon. Okay, well, we, I think we'll probably come more onto that later. Um, okay, so, when, so when, you're, when you're backing companies over such a long period, you really do get a front row seat into the changes that are happening within the culture and within these organizations. And over 40 years, I mean, that's a, that's a long stint. So you've witnessed, I imagine, some big changes. And one of them has been a, a, a real turnaround in, in corporate governance, which, you know, a decade ago, many people wouldn't have readily associated Japan with kind of a stellar track record in. So do you want to tell me more about what you've witnessed there? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, that Japan has made some pretty big strides in attitudes towards shareholders over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, so they've introduced a, a governance code and, and a stewardship code, and these things have had quite a big influence on how Japanese companies think about their obligations to shareholders. And I think that that's been uh, something that, that we've seen that coming through in terms of the dividends that, that Japanese companies are paying out. And I think that that's something that, that for us, as you say, it's something that doesn't get a lot of airtime uh, in the, the Western press. But I think these fundamental advantages of Japan as being a liberal democracy that, that upholds the rule of law, and this attitude towards shareholders that, that's been improving over time, I think those features remain a really good background for picking individual companies uh, and then, then letting capitalism do its work. So you've got these sweeping reforms that have been taken really quite seriously, but perhaps underappreciated internationally. And you've got a long-standing kind of culture of um, liberal democracy and, and respect of the rule of law. So all in all, it sounds like, a, like a, an improving place to, to, to invest capital. Yes, I, th I think that's right. That, that's very much how, how we see the situation. And you mentioned, you touched upon there the, uh, the changes in dividend paying culture. Could you elaborate a little bit more on exactly how that's impacted the trust in particular? Yeah, so if we go back, you know, to uh, the period kind of the mid 2000s, Japanese companies started to think a bit more about their dividends. They started to think about maybe having a payout ratio in terms of, of the dividend. And then we had the global financial crisis and there was quite a big setback in the dividends being paid by Japanese companies. But what's been interesting to us is during the current pandemic, there's been a much smaller a setback than the last time. And generally speaking, Japanese companies have pretty much held their level of dividends, which I think is, is very encouraging. And also on a forward looking basis, this large amount of cash that Japanese companies still have means that we regard the dividends as being very well supported uh, over the next 10 years, as hopefully some of that cash finds its way towards shareholders. And we've seen this with the trust itself,
Um, for many years, the trust didn't pay a dividend. Uh, but in 2018, the trust became able to pay a dividend again. And there's been some quite rapid increase in that dividend, albeit from a low base. And our main focus remains on, on the capital returns rather than the dividends. But it's obviously a helpful additional factor. Yeah, massively. So it's, so dividends um, will be significantly, you know, will play a much more significant role in the decade to come. Yes, I think that's that's likely. And one of the other interesting things about Japanese companies as well is that almost all Japanese companies pay dividends. So we've actually got some of our internet holdings, you know, yielding reasonable amounts. So, for example, SBI is an online brokerage, you know, which yields about 4% or GMO Internet, which does hosting and other things, yields about 1.5%. So, so these... Uh, the sources of income that we have access to in Japan, I think, are much better diversified than many parts of the world. And that sounds like a, a really great development. Um, let's talk about another change that you've seen over over the course of the sort of 40 years in the market. You briefly touched at the beginning about the change in con, um, index constituents. So you talked about there being lots of big banks, some car makers, yeah. um, and and more recently, that's changed quite significantly. So if we could take some time now to drill down into some of those changes and, and how the index constituents have altered over time. Yeah, so really there was a period in the, the kind of late 80s, early 90s when banks became completely dominant within the indices in Japan. and. You know, many of those banks, you know, no longer exist today. They've been merged into to other things. And then, you know, in the, the mid 2000s, we had the banks, plus we had the the, the car related companies. And, and they, there's a lot of, I guess, what we broadly dis describe as kind of quite old fashioned, traditional companies dominating the index. And now we've got a real mix of different things. So we've got big uh, index constituents now include things like SoftBank, uh, which is an internet business, Recruit, which is another uh, internet related recruitment business. And there are many other exciting robot companies and internet companies within the, the top parts of the index now. And so that just inevitably excites me as a, a growth investor to think that we've got, you know, some, some basically some more exciting uh, companies at the fore now within the Japanese stock market. So it's much more, a much more technology focused index now. I mean, we, we used to think yeah. of in Japan in the kind of late 80s and early 90s as kind of high tech, but it sort of lost its way. And, and, and what, you're, what you're saying here is, is, is back. <laughs> Can you talk to me about some, you mentioned sort of automation and, and um, so some of the increases in computing power that, that can facilitate this growth. So can we drill down again into, into that, sort of technology aspect and the types of companies that you're finding exciting there? Yeah, so we found one big, big area of excitement for us in the trust has been a whole variety of internet related businesses from e-commerce to online brokerage to web hosting and, and many others. And they make up in total a bit over a quarter of the portfolio. And then another area of biggest excitement for us has been the factory automation related area. And basically, about half of the global uh, robotics companies are listed in Japan. So we've got a great set to pick from within Japan. And that area makes up another 15% uh, plus of the portfolio. So those are two big technology uh, focused areas, which are significant parts of the trust. And I think where we, we just see a lot of opportunity going forward. Wow. So half the major global robotics companies are listed in Japan and 15% and of the fund is devoted to that type of exposure. So that certainly looks like very much future orientated considering the way warehouses are run, the way, the, the, the way in which kind of automation is going and the various different uses for it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. That, that in the past, you know, robots were very much limited to, to basically car factories, um, you know, and, and you had your arc welding robot or something like that, and it would sit in the corner of the factory in a big cage uh, with a big sign on it saying, you know, don't go near the robot because, you know, these, these are genuinely dangerous devices. And now what we're seeing is, is the evolution of cobots, 
uh, which are designed explicitly to work next to humans on, uh, say, packing boxes and things like that. And those robots are, have a very different fundamental design, a lot more sensors. They stop moving when they hit something uh, like a person rather than just continuing regardless. And basically, the, the big point here is that we think that the opportunity for, for robotics and automation is going to get a lot bigger uh, over the next decade um, as you're able to use robots in more different locations and for more different things, given that we now have better AI and better sensor technology uh, behind those robots. So, yeah, I think it's a hugely exciting area for, for the future. So it feels like the, the automation and the cobots in particular are bringing together the digital world and the physical world. And the portfolio obviously has a, a, a great exposure to that. But back in the physical world, I, does the trust still have lots of exposure in that, in that regard to kind of consumption names or Chinese demand? How, how does that play out? How does the, what does the physical world um, portfolio look like? Yeah, so, so fundamentally within the Japan team, we, we take quite an open-minded and flexible approach to growth, and it includes these kind of really high growth internet businesses, but it also includes some other types of growth businesses, including, as you mentioned, some of these consumer brand type of businesses, which they offer steadier growth, but over a very, very long time horizon. And so, for example, we've bought recently some cosmetics uh, related companies, including Polar, uh, which is a very high-end skincare brand in Japan. Also, Unicharm, which does nappies and sanitary products. And that business, we think, has a huge long-term growth opportunity ahead of it in Asia. So some of these businesses have been ones where I think recently people's attention has been very much on the, the highest growth things and also on this idea of cyclical recovery stocks. But we've been finding also opportunities in some of these, what you may think of as quality uh, growth businesses, where um, what we're looking at is a, a very long term, uh, steady type of growth opportunity. And I think perhaps people have slightly uh, missed the opportunity in these types of stocks at the moment. And then, so, as you say, within the trust, oh, I'm sorry, within the trust, no, no. we have a mixture of the, the, the internet and the physical world businesses. And that means that the from year to year, you know, some things are more in favor than others. So as the pandemic initially uh, hit, the internet businesses were very, very strong. And then more recently, we've seen a real recovery in the share prices of many of those physical world businesses as things have started moving again and supply chains have started to work properly again. And so, I, I also understand from a valuation perspective, think, you know, a lot of these uh, these growth opportunities are, are quite attractively priced still, compared to say kind of U.S. growth or Chinese growth. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, well, obviously I'm a Japanese fund manager, so we've got to aim off a little bit for that. But and I wouldn't like to comment so much on on things outside of Japan, but within Japan. Uh, the overall Japanese stock market trades on about 13 times EV to EBIT, and our portfolios trade on a bit of a premium in terms of a price to earnings multiple. But actually, because we've got so many businesses with very strong balance sheets within the portfolio, the EV to EBIT of our portfolio is actually a bit less uh, than the wider Japanese stock market, which is quite an unusual situation to end up in as a growth investor. But certainly, what I can say is I'm certainly not waking up at night concerned about the valuations in Japan. You know, quite the opposite. I think there's a lot to be excited about given the quality businesses that we have access to relative to, to the price that we're, we're having to pay for them. So, so yeah, I think it's a, an exciting time. So reflecting as, as this uh, webinar is all about on those 40 years, this, this certainly does feel like a, a very changed market. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. And in many ways, you know, the only constant in investment is, is the change. But I think, you know, hopefully within Bailey Gifford, we benefit from this this 40 year uh, history of investing specifically in the Japanese stock market. But at the same time, 
hopefully we have the mental flexibility to look at where the opportunities are going to be looking forward rather than than being captured by the past and i take it you are you are very optimistic about about the next decade yes i, I don't think there's any reason not to be optimistic about the the next decade i think the only thing that that i would also say though is that um as we mentioned earlier, you know, six times in the past 40 years, shareholders have had a 30% fall in the share price or more to contend with. So that would suggest that that might happen on average one and a half times in the next decade. So I think, you know, what I, I think we need to convey here is I think there is a lot of opportunity in Japan, but at the same time, in order for us to capture that opportunity, we have to accept an element of volatility in that journey um, and that's that's just something to, to bear in mind that those returns you spoke about at the start you know do incorporate you know ups and downs as well as being good over the long run okay and with that in mind how um you know not how you would advise but how do you commonly see the trust being used with investors um portfolios what what role does it play Yes, I mean, different people use it, it for different things. Um, I think typically people like to have a, an exposure to Japan, which is still one of the world's major economies with, with a lot of excitement in it. Um, and then, you know, from, from the, the, the underlying perspective, you know, I think what you have access to investing in Japan is a big, deep market of interesting companies. And then we try and choose the, the most exciting among them. And, and hopefully that leads to, leads to a, a, a decent investment outcome over the long run. Excellent. OK, well, we're nearing the end of um, the first section. And now I've got in front of me lots and lots of questions that are coming in from our live audience. So I'm going to turn my focus to those. Um, now, the first question I've got here, one viewer bought the Japan Trust and Shin Nippon, as you, as you mentioned, um, referenced earlier, eight years ago. And they've both done very well over the whole period since then. But in the last 12 months, they haven't done so well. Has Japan gone off the boil and do you expect this to change? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, well, first of all, uh, thank you to the, the person who asked the question for, for being a, a long-term investor. You know, it's, it's much appreciated. Um, and I think from our perspective, I think the answer to the question is, is almost within the question itself, which is over the longer time horizon, the ups and downs become averaged out um, and hopefully you, you experience the, the good outcome. Uh, but at the same time, in the short term, it, it's very, very difficult to predict uh, share prices in any type of short term way, be that a year or even three years. But what I can say, um, instead of focusing on, on the share price and the, the movements of those, I think what we can say is that the, the trusts, in my view, are filled with interesting companies uh, that, that are available at, at perfectly reasonable prices. So I would hope that that would drive the returns over the long run. Okay. Um, another question here about how many comp companies invested are in the same um, as your sister trust, Shin Nippon, and what percentage of net assets is the same? Okay, so Shin Nippon is a, um, the investment trust invests in smaller Japanese companies, I understand. So do you want to, to explain the difference here and any overlap? Yeah, so, so within Bailey Gifford, we perhaps unusually manage two different uh, Japan specialist investment trusts. Um, the Bailey Gifford Japan Trust was launched first, and uh, obviously the name, therefore, uh, wasn't uh, the most original name. It, it very much does what it says on the tin, and it has a focus on all, all market cap uh, companies, but with a slight focus towards medium and smaller companies. Then Shin Nippon was launched shortly after, and that's got a very explicit focus on small cap companies. And so the result is that the overlap between the two is about 20% at the current time. So it's not as high, perhaps, as many people would initially think. We also have the open-ended Bailey Gifford Japanese Fund, and the overlap between the open-ended Japanese Fund and the Japan Trust is more of the order of two-thirds 
So the Japanese fund and the Japan Trust are more similar to each other than the Japan Trust is to Shin Nippon, which is very different. And so Shin Nippon is invested in in really much smaller uh, companies and also indeed in some unlisted uh, companies as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, now, this, this question is much more to do with um, politics. So do you see any improvements in the Japanese market as a result of the change in prime minister? So for context, Fumio Kishida formally took office as Japan's new prime minister in October this year. Um, succeeding Yoshida Suga, who resigned after just one year in office. So, so how important is, is politics in <laughs> in your management? How, what role does politics play in, in the management of the trust, if any? Yeah, so, so as we spoke about earlier, I think the, the underlying background of, of Japan as a, a stable democracy is one that, that's helpful for us as a, an investment backdrop. But in terms of the changes of prime minister, um, I think there's been at least 20 over the past 40 years. You know, there's, there's been a lot of prime ministers in Japan um, to the point where I think we can safely conclude that it doesn't actually make that much difference to investors who the prime minister is. Um, I think Mr. Abe perhaps was a bit unusual in the sense that then we had Abenomics and these, these attempts at structural reform, which have been quite quite helpful, I think, to investors. But his successors have really been pursuing similar types of policies, and you know, we will we will see how long the the current incumbent lasts. But precedent uh, isn't very good for longevity for for Japanese prime ministers. Uh, so I think you know we 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 need to keep just focused on the the individual businesses and the, the opportunities for growth they have, really, rather than the the politics. Excellent. Okay. Um, right, we've got we've got a question here. Right about one of your biggest holdings, SoftBank. So it's num it's the number one position in the fund. Is it possible to explain why you hold this, and are you at all worried about SoftBank's recent investment philosophy and their China focus, given ESG and political concerns? Okay, so we're we're delving into ESG territory now, which um, is fresh ground for the webinar, but always extremely relevant. Yeah, so SoftBank, as as is noted, is the, the biggest holding in the trust. Um, we've had it for a number of years, and I think over a five-year time period to the, the, the last um, annual results, uh, SoftBank was actually the second largest contributor positively to performance over time. So it's been quite helpful to, to the shareholders having SoftBank within the portfolio. And I think as a growth investor in Japan, SoftBank is a very, very natural investment, and I think it's one that, that, yeah, I find it quite difficult myself to understand how you would be a growth investor in Japan, you know, without having a position in SoftBank. And there are three aspects to the case that I think are very exciting. The first is we do like the underlying investments that they have. Uh, there are the various big internet companies in there. There are also various ride-hailing companies, which I think have good long-term prospects, albeit they've had a setback during the pandemic. And then on top of that, we have a very large discount to the value of those shareholdings of about 50%. But then finally, the most important point is that we think that Mr. Son, who's the, um, Mr. Son, who's the, the manager and, and major shareholder in SoftBank, we think he actually has a very, very good track record, both as an investor and as a manager of businesses, um, going back now a, a very long time. Um, and we basically think he's underestimated by most people. Now, his approach is very much uh, to focus on the, the upside and to try and get the big winners. And inevitably that comes with some failures within the portfolio and those get a lot of attention in the press. But along that long journey uh, that he's had already, we've got to acknowledge that Mr. Son has become, depending on the day of the week, uh, the richest or the second richest person in Japan. So I really think he knows what he's doing and I think he continues to know what he's doing. Now, in terms of drilling into those specifics um, regarding uh, the situation uh, in China and how SoftBank sees it, I think Mr. Son has said himself, that he's been surprised by by some of the things 
that, that he's observed. Um, but at the same time, I think he also thinks that, that China remains the, the largest market in the world and it remains one where there are a lot of opportunities for growth investors at the individual uh, business level. So I think you know that there remains excitement there, and I, I think we are happy to continue to back Mr. Son. And you know, clearly within the context of the overall portfolio, although SoftBank has uh, some big investments in China, in general the portfolio as a whole doesn't have so much China exposure within it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we we referenced earlier the the triple D debt, deflation and demographics. So my next question um, that's come up here uh, is, is in relation to one of those Ds, demographics. Has Japan's demographic challenges given Japanese companies any valuable expertise in relevant sectors? Well, I think that's a really good question, actually, because what it's really put attention on is, is efficiency. Um, and with a declining labour force, it's been important for Japanese companies to be able to do more with less. Um, and that's encouraged automation uh, across a whole variety of sectors. And we're seeing quite a lot of efforts now uh, going into to new areas such as, you know, uh, paperless uh, transactions and, and things like that. So it, it's a continuing area. And I think in many ways, uh, the Japan story, I think, is one of quite a lot of actually optimism about the future for uh, the world in the sense that, you know, demographics are increasingly an issue across large parts of the world. Um, and actually Japan's remained a very prosperous uh, society despite the demographics, things have continued to progress in a whole variety of different areas. So yes, I, I basically agree with the, the questioner that uh, Japan has, you know, managed to find opportunities uh, out of out of this slightly tricky uh, situation with the, the ongoing low birth rate. It certainly seems like a case of necessity is, is the mother of invention there. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, lots more questions to get through here. So and there's some really, really interesting ones, um, really engaging with the material. Um, in view of the relatively low valuation of the Japanese market and the opportunity outlined for growth stocks, is it likely we will see more M&A activity in Japan? I think the answer to that is probably yes. There has been quite an increase in, in activist types of investors in Japan, you know, taking positions and agitating quite directly for cash to be returned to shareholders. Um, we also had a very, very interesting development last week uh, in Japan where our big holding SBI, the online brokerage, had been attempting to take management control of Shinsei Bank. And Shinsei Bank, going back in history, had to be bailed out by the government, and the government has a big stake. Anyway, Shinsei Bank wasn't too keen on SBI acquiring control, and so thought about trying to have a poison pill. Uh, but they decided at the last minute not to go ahead with the general meeting to approve that poison pill because essentially the government indicated that it would not support that. So the end result is that SBI has managed, I think for pretty much the first time ever in Japan, to effect a hostile takeover uh, in the banking system. And so this isn't something that, that we've seen, you know, front pages of the British newspapers or anything, but actually it's one of the, the most interesting things I've seen for quite a while in terms of news in Japan, because people often talk about the, the overbanked nature of Japan and all these small and not very efficient financial institutions. But Mr. Katao of SBI is now trying and actually succeeding uh, in, in improving that situation. So I think it's you know, genuinely quite quite an exciting time. And yes, I think it's in general, you know, these, these low valuations do encourage uh, activists. And our advice to, to Japanese companies is always that the best defense uh, against uh, activists is, is to have an appropriate share price. And, you know, that, that can be achieved by, you know, paying out good dividends and, and things like that. So, you know, I think in our experience, we've never really seen a, a kind of good, well-managed Japanese company be subject to, to that kind of aggressive intention. And, and we would generally expect that, that to remain the case. And that's our, our main focus.
Okay. Um, okay, another uh, question here. If Japan, if Japanese companies are so exciting, why do they appear so infrequently in portfolios of other Beta Gifford trusts and funds, i.e. those with wider remits? So, um, why is it, that it, first let's clarify, <laughs> is this the case? And secondly, um, you know, why, why is it the case that maybe they're not getting as much airtime in wider remits? Yeah, so I think, I think that, I think the observation, first of all, I think it is generally a correct observation. Um, and, you know, I think in many ways it's a question more for uh, my global colleagues who might be <laughs> better to answer the question than I am. I mean, we're enthusiastic about the, the opportunities in Japan. If I was to uh, try and look at it from that other perspective, I think one area where Japan hasn't been as strong uh, as many countries uh, has been in the internet area, where particularly uh, we find a lot of opportunities in Japanese internet companies within the domestic market, but we have to acknowledge perhaps with the exception of SoftBank, we have to acknowledge that really Japanese internet companies haven't really succeeded outside of Japan. And so many of my colleagues would say, well, look, you know, we would prefer to invest in the maybe US headquartered uh, internet business, which has a, a, a wider remit uh, in the long run. So, so that would be one aspect. But, you know, there's, there's obviously ongoing dialogue with our global teams and you know, there have been individual stocks bought and, you know, and it may be that that situation changes over time. And I guess also the other perspective on this is that um, from the, the perspective of the people watching and listening today, um, certainly an investment in, in the Japan team's funds, uh, such as the Japan Trust, uh, it isn't simply a, a doubling up of the exposure uh, to Bailey Gifford as a whole, because as as has just been noted, you know, the overlap is is not so high uh, between the two, and you know I would hope that it will change a bit over time, but but let's wait and see how the conversations keep going. Okay, um, one one point that we haven't particularly addressed actually um, throughout the the webinar so far is um, language. Um, so how important is fluency in Japanese? Um, to get information from the companies that you want to invest in. And does Bailey Gifford have fund managers and a research team based in Japan itself? Yeah, so it's a, again, it's a good question. Um, you know, and I wouldn't say that the that, that language is, is the main strength of our team, uh, but you know, over the, the, the 40 year time period of, of the Japan Trust, you know, the team has managed to deliver more than double uh, the return on an annualized basis of the, the topics total return index. So I think we can safely say that the language isn't the main criteria in terms of trying to outperform the, the Japanese index. But yes, we do have uh, within our, our desk, we have one Japanese speaker and also we have two native Japanese ladies uh, who work within Japan producing more thematic types of, of research for us. Um, and, you know, my experience of, of communicating with Japanese companies is that there's been a bit of a shift over the past 10 years. And, you know, in the past, maybe a third of meetings would be done in English, whereas now I would say over half of Japanese meetings are actually done in English. Um, and the Japanese obviously are very close politically to the US. Um, and, and I think that, that that kind of outlook is increasingly shaped uh, the, the Japanese business languages of choice and English is becoming you know, more common. Where we're not speaking in English, of course, we use a translator um, and that you know, is a, a pretty straightforward process. And in terms of access to materials, you know, the vast majority of Japanese companies produce things in English and Japanese and where they don't, you know, it's very straightforward to, to translate things into English where we need to. But our central message is we think the main important thing in investing is the, the mental models of which businesses do well over time. And, and so us, for us, we've never found language to be a particular issue in terms of having that core understanding of what businesses do well over time. 
And I suppose the pandemic has also you know, changed the physical um, connection too and, and, and actually made the digital connection a lot more viable on a regular business frequency. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the fascinating things about the pandemic at the moment is obviously, as you'd imagine, lots of Zoom calls uh, and, and similar technologies being used. And, you know, so, you know, this Monday morning, you know, 6.30 a.m., I was having a chat to Kubota, uh, the, the tractor company, you know, given the time difference, for example. Um, but one of the funny things about being unable to travel is, apart from being able to enjoy the, the lovely food and the culture of Japan, actually, if I was able to get into Japan right now, then the majority of Japanese companies are refusing to receive visitors uh, into their office at the moment. So I'd probably end up in the slightly farcical situation of sitting in a hotel room and then phoning up uh, the Japanese company from Japan. So in many ways it's a lot easier to to, to stay put and to, to do that job and i think you know in-person meetings definitely have their advantages but we do feel that that in terms of especially with companies that we know well you know zoom is a is a new and powerful tool uh, to have a better quality meeting than the old-fashioned uh, pure telephone type of meeting i think it's it's quite a big and helpful step forward actually yeah, definitely. We're, 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 we're definitely both feet in the modern world. Um, maybe uh, another question here, which taps into um, the sustainability. Um, how is sustainable growth factored into investment decisions? So is there a process maybe that you could explain here or a filter or the way in which you look at um, sustainable growth? Yeah, so when we, when we consider um, an individual investment, we basically look at, at four main areas. We look at the opportunity uh, that that business has in the long run. So is it operating in an area that's generally expanding over time where there's a good opportunity to, to basically take market share or to grow the sales rapidly into a new and emerging market? Then we look at something that, that the team internally has been describing as resilience plus which you could also think of as forward-looking competitive advantage. And what we're trying to do there is look at how much edge the business has, but trying not to think in a very static uh, way, but to think about how the edge is changing over time and whether it's going to be getting stronger or weaker uh, over the next five years. Then we look at the, the ESG related matters and you know, we take the, the environmental, the social and the governance factors in turn and we basically are asking ourselves the question you know do any of those have a material impact on the investment case then finally we look for upside and we look for things where we believe we can at least double our money uh, on a five-year view and, and hopefully do better than that that gives us plenty of space to make the, the inevitable errors so in terms of the sustainable growth part of it what we do is we, we incorporate it both with regard to that ESG question specifically, but also it often forms a part of the, the resilience plus of a business where you know, basically what we're trying generally to do is to, to try and invest in, in the companies of the future rather than, than too much in the, in the companies of the past. But again, it is for us a very individual uh, company thing and, and you know, we have to consider each company on its own merit and, and to think quite hard about, about those aspects in each case. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, we are nearing the the end of our, we, I've got through most of the questions here. The last one that's coming is, is, um, is, is actually a thank you rather than a question. Many thanks to Matthew Brett. His remarks today will make me take a serious look at Japan for the first time. So it, it feels like we've really oh. um, made, made the case for, um, the fifth entering the fifth decade of Japan and I mean it certainly looks like there's a huge amount of potential on the horizon and, and, and a lot changing which which looks very much sustainable too. Yeah well thank you very much for that that final observation and, and thanks Amy for, for having a chat today. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for your time and insights. And thank you all for watching and for your questions. And we've got more sessions like this coming up, so do keep an eye out for those if you found today.
useful. That's it from all of us. Thank you.